The health and medical information provided during this webinar, as well as the questions and responses from the webinar providers, are solely for informational purposes. This content is not intended to take the place of advice or treatment from health professionals. Nothing presented in the webinar is intended to be used for medical evaluation, diagnosis, or treatment. It is not intended to substitute for your relationships with your own healthcare and pharmaceutical providers. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider before beginning any new treatment or if you have questions regarding a medical condition. All right, with that being noted, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters. First up, we have Dr. Nicole Zell. Dr. Zell is a fellowship trained urologist who specializes in male and female stress incontinence, male and female sexual dysfunction, voiding dysfunction, bladder cancer, female pelvic floor disorders, and pelvic organ prolapse. Dr. Zell is located in Clearwater, Florida. Next up, we have Dr. Day Sheridan. Dr. Sheridan is a licensed mental health counselor, a board certified clinical sexologist, and a certified rehabilitation counselor. Dr. Sheridan is located in Tampa, Florida and specializes in issues of relationships, communication, intimacy, desire, arousal, reproductive health, infidelity, infertility, sexual function, sexual trauma, stress, anger, anxiety, depression, and much more. Today, they're going to be conducting a Q&A that covers everything love, relationships, and navigating the unique mental health challenges associated with ED. So without any further ado, let's kick off the event. We'll start by asking our audience a few questions and myths around ED and mental health. All right, first question is being launched now. So my partner is attending tonight's webinar with me, yes or no? All right, sharing the results now. Looks like we've got 54% say yes and 46 no. Right into the Q&A session. First question for our presenters here. Uh, can my prostate cancer treatment impact my AD? Yeah, so um, pretty common. Um, I think the incidence of ED after surgical treatment for prostate cancer is somewhere around 40%. Uh, anecdotally, I've seen it higher. And then I think after radiation, usually five to 10 years down the road, it's upwards of 30%. So absolutely. And then um, I think probably a good question to kind of follow up on that for Dr. Sheridan is, if I don't do anything to treat my prostate cancer because I'd like to avoid the complications like erectile dysfunction, what is the stigma that may be surrounding that? Um, but yes, absolutely. Treatment for prostate cancer, pretty much all treatments affect it. So, but that's my question for Dr. Sheridan too. Is so throw that one to me again. Is the stigma related oh, to not doing to treatment? Not, not treating it, because I think there's a lot of patients who say, well, you know, we have these conversations about, well, do I want to be treated? And a lot of people, well, I don't really want to be treated because of the side effects of the treatment. So then, you know, kind of how do you how do you just how how do you discuss that? Sure. Well, certainly, you know, your your health and being cancer free is going to always be the priority. But beyond the medical model, looking at our relationship with ourselves, our bodies, you know, our partners, as I said before, is crucial. But I think I'm going to be talking a lot and you probably too, Dr. Zell, this evening is rethinking about the way that we think about our sexuality and our body and how we function and the way things should be. And there are so many different ways to experience pleasure, um, to pleasure our partners, and to um, to forego treatment for a medical issue based on not being to be not being able to um, perform in a way that potentially you were before. It's there are so many options out there for treatment um, for ED as you know whether it's psychoemotional as and psychoeducational and learning more um, about, again, opening uh, different avenues to one's own sexuality, as well as, um, you know, medications. And there are all sorts of ways to, to work with ED. And so um, we want to make sure that you get treated first and foremost, and to recognize that whether it's as we age, or whether there's an illness or, a dis or an onset of a disability, um, we are still full whole sexual beings from birth and 
Um, we can keep doing that even if things are not the way that we hear on TV or see them, you know, discussed in our culture. So there's a lot of um, a lot of misinformation out there about how people are sexually. All right, moving on to the next question here. How do I deal with the fact I will never be the man I used to be sexually? Can I get past it? So I would say that's probably one of the um, most common questions that I get in my practice with um, the people that I'm seeing um, for erectile dysfunction. And, it, you know, the, um, the weight that that carries of uh, perception and perspective of um, virility and masculinity and what that means for one's sexuality. Uh, there are, as I said before, there are so many ways to look at things in a new and bright way that actually step us outside of the box that maybe we were in previously sexually. And so there are um, lots of tips and tricks that a sex therapist or, you know, sex self-help books or um, to help uh, men who, uh, who are being treated and or, um, you know, are diagnosed with ED to uh, reclaim their sexuality and reclaim their bodies in a new way. Absolutely. All right. Next question here. I've rarely experienced orgasms and feel guilty discussing it with my partner. How do I have the conversation without hurting feelings? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. So um, just to give a little background, because I, I try to have these conversations with patients because it's not very well understood, I think, um, until later in life. But um, erection orgasm and ejaculation are actually three different processes that occur kind of independent of each other. Um, but in, you know, certain times or certain sexual episodes will occur in tandem or together. Um, and I think people, you know, experience that as the norm. And, and, you know, for most men, they, I get the question, you know, pretty often, well, you know, if I can't have an erection, then, you know, obviously, I can't have orgasms, and I can't ejaculate. And, and I think that's a, a big misnomer for a lot of patients uh, until you discuss it with them is that orgasm and ejaculation and erection are three different processes. And later in life, and even early in life, you may experience ejaculation with no orgasm or no erection, or you may experience an erection and that doesn't lead to ejaculation. And then, you know, even later in life, I have patients come in and say, well, I'm not really getting a full erection, but I'm still having an orgasm and I'm still ejaculating. So just a little bit of a lead off to that question. I always like to stress to patients that those are three different things. And just because you're not having a full erection does not mean that you cannot have an orgasm or that you cannot necessarily ejaculate as well, so. Absolutely, and then uh, the second part of that question, how do I have the conversation without hurting feelings? So uh, I think we need to give each other credit when it comes to this, unfortunately, because talking about sexual matters, even with the people that we're having sex with, is so stigmatized and there's so much taboo and we don't, we're not given permission to create a comfortable, confident working vocabulary when it comes to sexual matters. Um, but, and especially with, with men, but they're just expected to be able to do things a certain way and it, things come naturally. And that's just not the case. It's like anything else we have to learn and grow and um, make mistakes and learn from them. And, you know, being able to be honest and open is going to be your most powerful ally in this because then you're going to be able to express yourself and ask for compassion and understanding from your partner um, rather than having the expectation that um, again there will be hurt or or um, disappointment uh, because it's it's nothing for partners to take personally it's it's like if there was any other, as you were talking about, Dr. Zell, the you know, body processes, if there was any other uh, issue with our health or our bodies, we wouldn't be blaming it um, you know, on our partners. We would be uh, loving and compassionate uh, about an issue that they're having physiologically. 
All right. Moving on to the next question here. Can taking testosterone affect my partner? Yeah, so obviously um, the side effects, you know, of testosterone taking um, testosterone when we discuss it with patients are, you know, you can have, you know, the physical things, increased hair growth, things like that. But you also have one of the most common side effects of testosterone is mood swings. So our emotional kind of well-being uh, as can change as a patient. And obviously, anytime your emotional well-being is changed or your mood is changed, this can have an effect on your partner, um, you know, a, a very dramatic effect at times, especially if, you know, they're used to, you know, communicating with you a certain way and that communication style changes, you know, due to mood swings or due to medication. Um, so absolutely can affect your partner. All right, next question here. Why does libido get lower as we age? How do we deal with this together? So um, testosterone is, um, is responsible for libido in both men and women. And so um, the output and the uptake of available testosterone that we have lowers as we age um, in, in both men and women. And so um, we're going to have, our bodies are going to behave differently, just like with all of the other physiological issues that go along with aging. I'm sure Dr. Zell can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, as we age, uh, obviously hormone status changes significantly. Um, brain chemistry can change as well with aging. Uh, we know that dopamine, uh, serotonin, and norepinephrine all play a large role in desire as well. Um, and all of the brain chemistry can change as we age. Um, one of the most common syndromes that we'll see kind of later on in life is um, difficulty with increased adipose tissue and weight gain, which can actually sort of lead to your hormones decreasing. As we put on more weight, as we take on more fat cells, there is an enzyme in fat cells that converts testosterone to estrogen. So we'll see a lot of the testosterone in our bodies kind of lag behind where, with estrogen increasing later on in life too. So all of these things can contribute to decreased libido with age as well. All right. Uh, how often is often enough to have sex when you have ED? Should I be having more or less sex when I'm being treated for ED? I'm on injection therapy and I'm limited to using the medication once a day. Well, another super common question that I get, um, you know, in sex therapy is, um, you know, how, how often should we do it? You know, or what should I, what should I be doing? And it's such an individualized question. It depends on you. It depends on, um, you know, what your love languages are and how your needs are being met and how the relationship is. There are so many things that can affect libido from, you know, how you're doing relationally with your partner, how you're feeling about yourself, your body image, um, all of the, uh, the, the hormonal issues and, and um, uh, neurological issues that go along with that. And so there, I, I would say there's absolutely no one um, answer to that. It's about, I love to say it's about collaboration with your partner. Um, people say compromise, but I think when we, say, when we hear compromise, we think we have to give something up to get something to. And so that collaboration, um, but recognizing that, um, you know, the desired discrepancies uh, are super common and it's very rare for two people who um, care about each other and are engaging sexually with one another have the exact same libido um, at the exact same day. I mean, there are, you know, mood changes, fluctuations in energy, in, um, you know, what kind of day you're having, you know, whether how connected you're feeling to your partner. There are so many um, facets and so many variables there. It's really, that's a, that's a sole um, question asked both you and your partner to work together to find out what works for you. All right, uh, next question here. How do I involve my partner in my treatment without feeling uncomfortable? Bring them with you to the physician. <laughs> I ask everyone, if we're talking about this, if you have a partner, Please feel, to bring, please feel free to bring them. I'm happy to answer their questions. Let's all talk about it together. Yes, any desensitization 
um, where again, developing those vocabularies, being able to feel comfortable talking about it, um, and recognizing that it's it's not it's not our fault, right? That it it's faulty sex ed. <laughs> it, so, you know, if you if you grew up in the United States, there was very little information provided to you. Um, there's very little medically accurate information provided to you. So having that that comfort and the ability to talk um, in an educated manner about our bodies, like from our belly buttons to our knees, is not readily available for most people. And so, you know, having the, your experts and your your physician to be able to walk you and your partner through um, what are some things to look for. Here are some experiences that you may have. Here are some roadblocks, um, you know, in communication and um, and 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 talking about that is going to be really crucial. So using your resources for sure and recognizing that you're not alone in this. Absolutely. So, so I have another question here that's pretty similar to that. How do I tell my new partner that I have ED? You tell them. <laughs> if you're, it depends on um, the trust being built. It depends on closeness. It depends on where you're at um, in moving forward with sexual activity with your partner. Um, but I think with my clients, you know, talking about this very matter of factly and saying, but I, ha you know, but I have lots of other ways to play and other, you know, ways that let's talk about pleasure and and what you enjoy and what I enjoy and. Um, and again, to think outside of the box uh, and that sex doesn't have to be just, you know, penetrative, you know, like, again, like that we're taught that there's one way to be and there just isn't. So being very matter of fact, if you come into the conversation with confidence and um, with, you know, talking about this as a medical issue that you are treating, um, but that it's something to be aware of, you'll find um, hopefully that your partners will be very on board and appreciative of the honesty. Absolutely. All right, next question here. How do we get back to having regular sex after years without it now that I'm on a successful treatment plan? Yeah, so um, definitely communication is key here. So um, one thing I, I, you know, obviously with with our male patients, you have found something that works for you. Congratulations. That's wonderful. But the important thing here, the super important thing is as a clinician for us to kind of come in and say, OK, but let's talk about your partner because you, you know, have not been having you probably have not been having the type of, you know, intercourse or outer course that you are used to until now you're ready for this again. So we want to talk to your partner and we want to make sure your partner's prime, too. And I always talk about priming. Um, as is that being my term that I use um, to patients, but really, you know, bringing your partner in and saying, okay, you know, how are you feeling about this? You know, where are you in the process? Um, you know, obviously you're here and you're supportive and that's, you know, always the first step, but what can we do to make it more comfortable for you? Should we talk about lubrication? Should we talk about AIDS? Anything else that we can talk about to make you more comfortable in this situation so you both enjoy it together, which is the most important part is um, that's really going to be key. Absolutely. And inviting them in to discuss anything that has gone on during um, previous issues where there might have been anxiety or frustration or, you know, any sort of discord that can be created by a lack of that physical intimacy and building that emotional intimacy back up with each other, not just hopping back in the sack because I'm ready to go, but sit, but recognizing that your partner, you may have some explaining to do and you may have some, um, you know, breaking down some barriers and some walls with each other because, um, you know, ED creates a disconnect for so many couples and there unfortunately can be shame or guilt or embarrassment involved. And so it's about talking through all of that and assessing your readiness and your partner's readiness and really easing back into it. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> all right, next question here. Can having more sex prevent ED from progressing or getting worse? So 
So um, <clears throat> I'm going to answer the question. It's not really a simple yes or no. So um, if we look at erectile dysfunction organically, physically, erectile dysfunction is a problem of blood flow. There are a lot of emotional, mental, psychological aspects that go into this. But really, physically, if we just looked at the physical act of erection, it's all about blood flow. So the more blood flow that you can promote on a regular basis, the better it's going to be um, to have an erection um, comfortably over and over. Um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, having, you know, any sexual activity, even if it's uncomfortable for you or for your partner, you know, I, I don't I don't like to anyone to think that, you know, as long as you're doing it, it's great. You know, it has to be the good type where everyone enjoys it. You know, everyone's happy. And again, that's the communication. But physically, if we only talk about the physical active erection, blood flow in is better, more blood flow. So um, that's just that part of the question. Sorry, and I'll give it to Dr. Sheridan. No, that's perfect because that's that's the part that you need to talk about in a way that I that I can't. And so, um, but certainly, um, you know, more of a good thing is not always better. And so, um, if you are having um, ineffective sex, even with um, without erectile difficulties, it's going again. It's going to create that disconnect. It can create anxiety reactions, which then creates you know more performance issues that are that are psychoemotional that have nothing to do physiologically. And that's where I see with some of my clients who who are taking uh, medications and have been taking medications with really positive results, but now there are um, psychological and emotional issues attached to that, that that even can't bypass what is happening with the blood flow to the penis. So it really is, um, it's not necessarily, okay, everything's working great, just keep, keep working and doing it so that we don't lose it. I don't know that it's a use it or lose it um, situation here. All right, uh, next question here. I've noticed that my boyfriend is having trouble getting and keeping it up recently. How do I address my partner's ED without hurting his feelings or embarrassing him? So it depends on, um, you know, is uh, is this been long term? Um, are there life changes? Are there changes in other health issues? Any issues with nutrition, you know, hydration, sleep? mood changes, um, you know, uh, traumas, anything that's been going on that may contribute to um, the lack of being present um, and being mindful um, during sexual activity. Uh, so certainly just, again, coming from a loving, kind and compassionate perspective of saying, hey, I noticed that something is different lately. Um, would you like to talk about it? And um, and if not, um, you know, is there somebody that you would talk to about it? But certainly approaching it with um, with kindness um, and noticing that something's going on with your partner. All right, next question here. Can relationship stress cause ED or is it mostly a physical problem? It's a roll of the dice there. Yeah. It could be, it could be, yes, yes. No, and maybe it could be all of the above. That's exciting. All right, next question here. Recent ED and the issue is all on my side. My wife thinks, fears it's her. How do I reassure her? That's communication. Very much comes back to communication. Um, and, you know, basically, sitting down and just saying, hey, things, you know, uh, I'm having some difficulties, you know, what can we do? Let's talk about this. Um, and uh, I mean, it is some reassurance. I'm sure Dr. Sheridan will speak to that. Um, but, you know, it's also one of those things too, engaging with your partner and what can I do to make, you know, what can I do to please you? Um, what out of our sexual activity is the best for you? What do you prefer? Um, and start there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, 
people people can take this personally uh, and again but if we can just bring it back to and compare it to other you know medical issues like you can't you know you're diabetic you can't will your your pancreas to make more insulin it's not your partner's fault if your sugars change you know there's just there are so many different examples of ways to look at this medically um, and if there are different, so, you know, communication is absolutely always going to be the key, but a lot of couples don't have good, open, honest, or healthy communication styles, strategies, or skills, um, so that right, skills to be able to apply it in, with a very sensitive topic, a controversial topic, one that, you know, everybody's just supposed to know what to do and be good at. So, um, you know, Again, reading books or going to see a therapist or a counselor uh, just for marriage therapy, not even necessarily sex therapy, um, but to be able to learn ways to talk about difficult issues with one another um, in a healthy way so that, you know, and when you can talk about sex and when you can talk about eating, you're going to be able to talk about everything, right? There's going to be so many topics that are going to be easier to um, to broach with one another when you know that there is a safe space to land and that there's trust built and that you're going to, um, you know, be communicating in a manner which, again, shows that love and compassion, um, but truly asking to get your needs met in healthier ways. Okay. Um, are there any treatments for my wife after she goes through menopause? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> um, pretty important um, to discuss with women menopausal status and then hormone status. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a, a very hot topic um, for many and women, but specifically for women because there's a lot of literature that says, you know, one way or the other. But I think it's a really important topic to discuss um, specifically with your physician. Um, hey, you know, where am I at in hormones? How do we get them checked? How do I replace them? Is that going to help my libido? And the answer is yes, somewhat. And then, you know, also let's talk about your medications. Um, you know, what medications are you given now? You've gone through menopause. What may have been added? What may have been taken away? Um, cause that can affect, you know, your libido, your drive, um, your lubrication, your orgasm, your just you know, all, all aspects of your sexual activity. And then, um, you know, also important to talk about, um, we can talk a little bit about Addy, which is, you know, one of the newer uh, uh, medications on the market to help with desire. So all of these things are available. They just, we just happy to talk about them. So Dr. Zell, can I ask you, uh, what would you recommend? It, would you recommend that people start with their primary or would you recommend that these conversations go to a specific specialist? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so I think it's always a good idea to, to start with your primary because there are going to be primaries that are going to be very receptive to having this conversation and how can I help you? Um, but if they're not, um, a lot of the times then they'll, you know, they should be able to refer you to someone like a sexual medicine physician, like a specialist, like a gynecologist, like a urologist, like someone who does feel comfortable having these discussions or does have these discussions regularly and um, can kind of go uh, from there. Yeah. All right, got kind of a fun question here. Is sexy storytelling healthy for foreplay? For me, it seems to jumpstart my mind and body to help stimulate an erection. Yes, foreplay is mental, it's physical, it's emotional, and um, whatever floats your boat, whatever can create anticipated desire, um, foreplay can start, you know, at, at 8 a.m. when you're not even going to uh, see your partner until the evening. So anything that you've found that um, elicits the response that you're looking for and keeps you excited, aroused, um, and your mind open and available, uh, I think is wonderful. I think it's great for people to explore lots of different avenues um, that there are ways to um, attain and maintain arousal in ways that they might not have thought about before. But I love a sexy story time, that's great. Who doesn't? Uh, all right, so next 
question here. If a couple doesn't make time for sex, how can it damage a marriage? Um, I'm going to just touch a little bit, but I think the uh, physical connectedness that comes from any sort of the physical connectedness and the emotional connectedness that comes from any sort of physical interplay or intimacy is going to help people um, in their partnership no matter what. It doesn't mean it has to always be penetrative sexual intercourse. There are lots of ways to be intimate with your partner. So, but I, I think it's a, a very important part of a relationship. Sure. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we have relationships and we have love and all sorts of love and um, you know, connection with different people in our lives. We love our friends. We love our families. We love our children. But our partners are the. It's, that's the one person, or or if you have multiple partners, the more than one person that you share that type of physical intimacy with. And I feel like sometimes that if that's been there before, and then it starts to wane, um, people go on to be just like super awesome roommates with one another. And that they can look back at how things might have been previously, or they'll hear other, you know, couples talking, and maybe they want um, it to be more like that themselves. Um, as we talked about before, there's no specific number or, you know, frequency or duration or that's going to work with, for everybody. But I do ask my couples that if there has been a lapse, um, especially if there's been you know, healthy sexual interactions in the past, or, you know, if they've had effective and good and pleasurable sex with each other previously, but that's waned and desire is down and connection is down to really look at that. And there's no specific time frame, but I will say anecdotally, um, if you've gone two weeks or more without touch, right? Just as Dr. Zell said, it doesn't have to be without penetrative, you know, sexual intercourse. It could, it, it, you know, I'm talking about if you're deciding to sit, you know, on the recliner over here and your partner's on the couch over here, you know, when you're watching a movie versus laying together and cuddling or just holding hands, having your feet touch, these small interactions, they help with your hormones and your pheromones and connectedness. There's so many things that are going on to make us feel wanted, loved, and appreciated, encouraged, desired, um, you know, by our partners. And so if it's been more than two weeks where there's any sort of um, physical affection that's being shown, um, I encourage people to look at that and what's going on with me, what's going on with my body, and what's going on with our exchanges. You know, um, you know, is work really stressful? You know, having having kids really stressful? Like life will suck the life right out of your sex life. And so recognizing that things will ebb and flow, absolutely, but to be mindful and not to be embarrassed or um, not to worry about bringing things up because, well, I don't want to be the one to bring it up. You know, both of you know, both of you know it's been a while. So just talking about it openly and saying, hey, what do you think's going on with us um, could just be a great start. Okay, I uh, got kind of a different question here. How does one go about finding an experienced and competent urologist or sex therapist? Um, well, we have um, all kinds of different platforms and venues and different websites that urologists will be listed on um, specifically depending on, you know, what, what you're looking for. Um, but I think for the most part, go by people's ratings and also go by word of mouth um, who's in your area and who, you know, have you heard from people around you that has, you know, helped them. And, and I think that that's, I think word of mouth is actually one of the, the best ways, even though it's kind of an ancient way nowadays. Um, but that's, you know, what, yeah. Absolutely. And sometimes people um, hasten to mention, you know, especially as it for, you know, urology is broad, there can be lots of different things that that are going on. But sometimes specifically when you say sex therapy, like, 
I don't have a ton of reviews <laughs> that say thank you so much for helping with you know my sex problems or what have you. So um, and pe but people do share with their friends and family absolutely because um, and part of my job is helping people talk openly about it because there's nothing to be ashamed of. And so uh, being able to talk about things that have helped, whether it's uh, mental health wise, whether it's with your body, with your partnerships. Um, but in terms of clinical sexology, board certification is really important. There's the American Board of, um, of Sexology, as well as um, ASACT, which is the American Academy of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. So, um, and they both have directories to look, um, to look up and to see wh who are people in your area who are highly trained, um, because that is actually an issue um, Florida uh, tends to be um, one of the only states uh, that actually has further training for sex therapists and clinical sexologists, but there are states all over the country that people can hang shingles and call themselves sex therapists without any further training. So, you know, being able to find board certified um, uh, clinical sexologists or sex therapists in your area um, can be really important because not knowing enough can, can do damage, certainly, especially if there's any sort of trauma um, or sensitive issues surrounding that. Uh, so next question here, uh, is it possible to have spontaneous sex with ED? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I yes, absolutely. Uh, again, definition of sex here, if we're talking about, you know, straight penetrative sex, might take a little bit of planning even with spontaneity, um, especially depending on where you are at the treatment process. Um, but I think that it, I think that's a, a very fair thing to have. Um, but yeah, I just think it takes you know for, some foresight and planning to kind of say, oh well, you know now the nice thing that we know is we have a 72-hour pill, so you know in the next couple of days it might happen. So, um, but yeah, I certainly think nowadays, especially, it's a, it's a lot more possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, so if someone is to kind of follow up on that question, if someone's on, let's say, injection medication, how would they go about being a little bit more spontaneous since there's a bit more of a buildup period once they inject? Right. So um, I have patients um, or, I, you know, we do have patients who, you know, will we'll know ahead of time that they're going to be seeing their partner or, you know, someone that they're with. And so they'll, you know, kind of inject an hour or two beforehand um, or, you know, another thing is it may be not necessarily the most spontaneous, but it is possible to bring your partner into the idea of those injections. I do have some patients. I encourage that. I say, you know, bring your partner into this. Let's make sure that they're comfortable with it and they know how to do it. So if you both decide it's the right time, well, now you have two people working together on this. Absolutely. I love that idea. It, that's so important. Um, and it that becomes foreplay in and of itself instead of being something that is, you know, secretive or shameful or embarrassed. It becomes like no, this is this is the new normal and it's great. And we can make that sexy um, and we can we can help the lead up. Um, another thing I just want to say is that, you know, spontaneous sex is so rare. <laughs> It's so rare um, for real human beings who have jobs and kids and houses and, you know, all of these different things. And I think, you know, we we're talking about myth, bu myth busting earlier on. I think the idea of this, you know, movie, so I see you from across the room and there you are and there I am and kiss, kiss, kiss. And we fall onto the bed and, you know, make love for 13 seconds and there's a mutual orgasm. Like That's not real life. Like our bodies fall out of position, um, you know, they make noises, they work sometimes the way we want them to, sometimes they don't. And so really um, taking away preconceived notions that are created by the media or, you know, really poor sex ed or, you know, from your teenage neighbor who told you how it was supposed to be when you were 12, you know, we have to really update and upgrade the way that we look at um, what, can, what contributes to really pleasurable and fun sexual interactions with, an, with one another. And I think that sometimes even scheduling sex can be sexier than spontaneous sex. Absolutely. Um, next question here is kind of around uh, 
prostatectomies. Uh, what mental health challenges should a couple be aware of ahead of a radical prostatectomy? You want to start uh, there, Dr. Zell, and I'll add on. Absolutely. So, um, I, I mean, I try to, you know, have these conversations with people beforehand and say, you know, life, uh, let's not sugarcoat it. Life is going to change. Your old normal is not the normal for you anymore. There's going to be a new normal, but that new normal is possible and it's going to work and we're going to make it work. And let's figure out what we have to do together to make that work. So. Absolutely. It's, a, it's, it's truly about um, looking at your expectations, right? And uh, I think sometimes people can be in a little bit of denial uh, when there is any sort of, like I said, illness or, dis or onset of a disability um, and being able to um, have good conversations and find an amazing physician like Dr. Zell who is going to talk openly about those things and not be like, okay, well, we've got the cancer and that's it and the rest of you doesn't matter. You know, you want to find somebody who's going to talk about your full whole self and how relationally that matters and physically that that matters and that there is so much excitement and hope because so much of what we think we know about sex is, is just a tiny, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Um, and there are so many different ways to experience, to give and receive pleasure, um, even when there's been physiological changes. And so finding a really sex positive physician who is going to take a little bit of extra time with you, I think is important. Um, but, you know, their job is to keep you healthy. And um, so then finding somebody else to talk more openly and create strategies to um, slowly but surely find that new normal, um, it, you know, is really, really possible. Okay. Uh, next question here is around depression. We actually got a couple of these. Um, to what degree does depression affect men's interest in sex and ability to perform? Well, it's certainly one of the number one reasons that um, that I see for for low libido. You know, anxiety and depression, the combination of both, um, really does a number on uh, the way that we see ourselves, the way we carry ourselves, um, just energy, fatigue, the um, just to have desire in and of itself. Um, you know, there are so many psychoemotional processes that are that are in play. Um, again, but serotonin, um, you know, there are not connecting with somebody and just being disconnected, um, uh, you know, both emotionally, physically, psychologically, um, you know, and sometimes depression doesn't always present the same in everybody. Not everybody is can't get out of bed and, you know, throws the covers over their, their head. Some people it, it shows as, as aggression or anger, frustration, uh, you know, low frustration tolerance. Um, and so it really depends on um, each individual. But depression, any sort of mental health or psychiatric disorder can contribute to low libido um, and disconnect from a partner for sure. Okay, uh, follow up on that, is psychosomatic ED real? Mm -hmm. That's when they, they start, everybody starts by going to Dr. Zell and then those, those clients end up with me. Um, because one of the first things that I ask my patients is, you know, have we ruled out, um, have we ruled out um, physiological, medical um, issues? Uh, and if those have been ruled out and or, or if they're treated successfully, then we have to look at what else is going on. And so often it really is a relationship with one's own sexuality and giving oneself permission, you know, again, to be a sexual being, to recognize body changes um, and try something new that um, that maybe may have been you know stigmatized or thought of differently before but but absolutely all right uh, after countless failures with pills and lasers how do I deal with failure or fear of failure now that I'm moving on to injections um, discussing expectations with your partner specifically oh. Um, you know, what is the end goal here between the two of you? Because what is, I find that a lot of our male patients, their end goal is just, I need to get my erection. I need to get my erection back. But your partner's kind of in the background saying, well, I'm here and I want to participate with you however way I can. And, you know, they might, they're probably not the ones sitting there saying you need to get your erection back. 
So I really think figuring out your goals and expectations together is going to really, really, really help curb a whole lot of that. You know, if this doesn't work, I'm doomed. If this doesn't work, I'm doomed. You know, it's never going to be the same. So, um, you know, really discussing these expectations and what can come out of this and, and what you're hoping to accomplish together with your treatment. Um, instead of solely, because erectile dysfunction is not a one-person problem. It, it really is a two-person problem. I, I, I know because, you know, I hear wonderful people like Dr. Sheridan say these things, and it really is important that, that we remember that. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, the idea that, um, you know, that you have to do this on your own, and that it's something that it's your problem, and um, I, I really think it it uh, it can set us up for failure, and it can create that with it can create the disconnect which you're trying to improve upon by being you know sexually active with your partner. And um, so often, you know, these conversations are avoided, but when they're discussed, the person with ED will find that their partner does does not mind what's going on, that there is a lot of patience and that there is um, the desire to explore other avenues and that the thing that you think is the only thing may not be that, you know, on that person, on your partner's mind. And so really having those conversations, people are, are, are regularly surprised by the answers of just an of asking questions that we've avoided for so long. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Zell, I mean, just another follow-up question to you. For someone moving from pills to injections, is there any more reassurance for this person uh, knowing that injections are more powerful or maybe a little bit more uh, uh, success? There's been more success with injections? So um, it, there's a really good study that looked at patients with ED and their partners, and it looked at every treatment modality. So it looked at medication, it looked at injections, it looked at, looked at vacuum devices, it looked at, you know, implants. And um, there really was no difference in patient satisfaction across the board, except slightly more for implants. But the reasoning behind that was because they were more reliable. So the reliability of that for the patient and their partner is what made the most difference. But if you look at, you know, success rate of all these different treatments, um, you know, they're, they're very much on par with each other. Um, you know, I, I think we look at injections as like, you know, the big go-to when in reality, they've just been around the longest, um, you know, besides vacuum devices. And so because, you know, Viagra and Cialis and uh, Levitra and Sendra were all, they're all, they really are newer drugs. Um, whereas injections are what we had before we had the oral pills. So um, I think that, you know, kind of taking away that stigma of, oh, this is even better, you know, or this is even better is important because really, if you look at success rate with patients and their partners, they're all pretty similar, except for that one, um, that one area of reliability. Okay. Uh, got a, another question about uh, starting a discussion with their partner, slightly different than the first one. Uh, I have to inject Trimix to maintain an erection during intercourse. I'm single. How should I begin a discussion with a new partner? So, you know, a discussion with a new partner is always met with a little bit of trepidation, um, anxiety. You know, we, we like somebody, we want them to like us. There's you know that halo effect of you know if I if I like you I want you to like me and and I'm going to attribute all of these wonderful characteristics and so I don't want to burst that bubble either by saying that there's something going on with me that you need to know but when it comes to any you know initial sexual experience we should be talking to our partners openly um, hey have you been are you on using any sort of contraception or birth control um, have you been tested for sexually transmitted infections or diseases you know um, do you, are there any issues what do you what do you enjoy so this can be just part of a again a new normal of being really open and communicative and confident um, that this is something that I you know that I have to take care of and but um, hopefully we'll have a good time. And if there are any stutter steps or any issues, let's just talk about it. But we know nobody's perfect and 
um, but it shouldn't it shouldn't keep us from enjoying each other in lots of different ways. So it's normalizing, it's validating, um, and if we can normalize this in our conversations, um, then we're going to be better off across the board. Great. All right. Next question here. I'm in my 70s and getting treated for ED, low T, and Peronis. I'm discouraged when my, when my wife says, give it up. Should I give it up? And then he signs it with a frowny face. Sorry, say that again. Um, I'm so sorry. You said, do you mind repeating just that last part? Yeah. Yeah. So he's uh, getting treated for ED, low T, and Peronis. He's discouraged when his wife says, give it up. And he wants to know if he should give it up. Okay. Um, well, I think the more important conversation to have there is to ask, um, you know, why should we give it up? And, you know, can we, what's our common goal here together instead of. And have those, and have those conversations become contentious where there's, um, you know, there's disagreements or, you know, there's frustration with one another or, you know, snippy comments or, you know, has this become something that is fodder for, you know, not getting along? Because if there are people who um, have lots of relationship issues that are also dealing with sexual issues. And so, you know, what, how you're treating each other outside of the bedroom um, is going to parlay of how you're treating each other inside of the bedroom. So I'd also look deeper into what's going, how is the relationship going? What are, looking at expectations and what are mutual goals that you can look at? Um, because if you're just, you know, going full steam ahead and this is important to you and your partner has been telling you, you know, I love you no matter what, and this isn't that important to me. I don't want you to be fixated on this. How can I be helpful to you to increase your confidence so that you don't feel um, so, you know, and sometimes it can become, it can become obsessive because when there's something wrong or there's something that's different about us, um, we can ruminate on how things were. And so, you know, a comment after a lot of that could be just, you know, move forward or get over it or just give it up out of frustration, but it may be really like, hey, that may be a call to say, are there other options? Can we talk about other ways for us to connect, communicate, um, and you know, engage with each other um, physically without the stress that is put on us based on um, you know this ED issue? Great. Yeah, and we're getting close to uh, eight o'clock here. I've got a follow-up question to that, but we're going to ask two more questions, and then we will uh, go ahead and wrap up the event. So uh, next question here, kind of following up on that last one and some of the answers uh, you both gave, but uh, can being treated poorly by former sexual partners impact future relationships? Does sexual or romantic PTSD exist? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I see it every day. Um, and unfortunately for some people, it could take one comment, you know, years and years ago that creates a lack of, of sexual confidence, um, a lack of confidence in one's body image, or just how they, you know, how they utilize and care for and have a relationship with their own, with their own reproductive system and their genitals. Um, there, you know, whether it's, um, again, there could be sexual trauma, there could be relationship discord or emotional abuse, and all of that can preclude us from wanting to engage fully and openly, be vulnerable. There's so much vulnerability when it comes to, you know, being sexual with someone or exploring being sexual with someone. And if that trust has been broken before, it could be, it can be, take, a, it could take some time um, and some work to be able to end to find the right person to be able to be open to that again, especially if someone has outright been cruel or shamed you about something that's going on with your body. And um, a lot of my male patients with ED have had some semblance of that in their, um, you know, in their, in their history. And it, it takes, a, it takes some undoing for sure. All right. And the last question continues the relationship theme here. Uh, it feels like my relationship was destroyed by my radical prostatectomy. I know injections are an option, but I haven't tried them yet. I'm embarrassed to even cuddle because I can't get aroused like I used to. How do I move forward and preserve my relationship 
in my confidence after this. So um, this is our central theme of communication. Um, this is a very important time to engage your partner and say, what is our common goal here? Is our common goal to have penetrative sex? Is our common goal to get closer and intimate with other you know, uh, sexual practices? Um, how important is having this you know, erection over and over and over again for you, for me, for us together? Um, 100%, you can absolutely try, you know, medications, injections, and things like that. That is absolutely on the table, but that's a big important thing to discuss with your doctor, especially, and to bring your partner in and say, this is our goal. How, how can we try to accomplish that together? Because if your goal is to have an erection, if your goal is to move forward towards, you know, any penetrative sex, then yes, that is the time where we would talk about medication, injections, and other therapies. But I think that, again, you know, what we can't stress enough is, and I always love to ask patients, please bring your partner. Let's, you know, figure out what our common goal here is together. Mm -hmm. And to get out of our own heads, right? We have these preconceived notions that, there's one way that my partner can, that I can signal that I, that I desire them. And that's me, you know, rubbing up against them and them feeling something. And there are just, we have to step outside of um, really just that, that one way to think about being intimate with, with others and, you know, really build that relationship with ourselves and building that confidence because you'd be really surprised what you think is so important may not be important to your partner, but you've never discussed it. And so um, you may find that there are, you know, lots of things that your partner really, really digs about you that has nothing to do with your penis. And so hearing that can build that confidence and build closeness between the two of you. And you can work on doing all sorts of you know, new strategies and exercises where you can move the locus of pleasure somewhere else and you may find you really enjoy that. So communication, 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 like Dr. Zell said. Yeah, maybe we should have changed the, uh, the name of the event. <laughs> maybe for next time. All right, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Zell and Dr. Sheridan for taking the time to present today. We'd also like to thank uh, everyone listening in for attending this MinMD Real Talk webinar. We hope it was informative and that you'll join us again in the future. If you'd like to learn more, you have a few options. Uh, there are more resources in the Resource Center on MinMD.com. Visit this page to view instructional videos, guides, expert articles, and much more. You can also schedule an appointment with a MinMD clinical case manager. To do so, you can call MinMD at 857-233-5837 or log into the Password Protected Secure MinMD portal. I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar, and we will see you at the next one.